temporarily banned oil and gas development, while all the state waits for Democrats in the legislature to pass sweeping new oil and gas regulations. The five Democratic commissioners voted unanimously this afternoon for the ban. They gave citizens 24 hours notice of the proposed ban, and then following that vote, two commissioners were heard on an open mic, laughing about the hours of passionate testimony, which was largely against that ban. My thoughts on that in a moment. The six-month moratorium is effective immediately. Adams County commissioners passed a similar temporary ban right before November's elections. In that case, they also gave one day's notice to the public. The reasoning for these bans was similar. With the possibility of new regulations on the way, Adams County didn't want oil and gas companies rushing in permits right under the deadline. The commissioner's unanimous vote today followed hours of public comment. Please consider what you're doing to all these people and all the people who work so hard for this industry and who want to stay in Colorado and enjoy the places we've been from and our roots and everything we have going forward. Thank you. And coming to Colorado, I mean, we have a lot of people who come and visit us for our beautiful natural habitat. And if we continue drilling at the rate that we're going, I'm afraid we're going to lose that. Adams County Commissioner Steve Odorizio told us that the bare minimum 24 hours notice for the hearing was not an attempt to prevent the public from mobilizing against the ban. And he says that it also was not designed to keep developers from submitting development permits before it took effect. In fact, Odorizio claimed credit for the strong attendance at the hearing. No, we just made the decision that we needed to hear what staff had to say and we needed to do it in an open and very open manner. And so we did a public hearing and we made sure that this place was full and it was full. The oil and gas regulations that have passed the state Senate are now being heard in the House. They would give state regulators the option to do a statewide temporary ban on oil and gas development. But Adams County commissioners said today they didn't want to rely on the state. A quick word about how Adams County does business, and this goes beyond oil and gas development, and it goes beyond partisan politics. I've said here what an insult it is to voters that Adams County leaders keep springing these highly controversial bans on the public with just 24 hours notice. Today, they doubled down on the disrespect. Commissioner Emma Pinter said at the hearing she was humbled and grateful so many people took off work to speak at today's hearing. I bet those workers would have been humbled and grateful if they didn't have to do it on a day's notice. And following the vote, Commissioners Mary Hodge and Eva Henry were caught on an open microphone laughing about the hearing. Commissioner Hodge saying how it wasn't as bad as the hearings when Democrats banned high-capacity ammunition magazines a few years ago. Adams County's elected leaders don't just make it hard for their citizens to speak out. They laugh at them when they do. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger says the Democrats of the state legislature are going for the Republicans' holy grail, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Marshall explains why they want to do away with Tabor's tax refunds. Let's just say it and get it over with. Tabor. Okay, don't fall asleep. You're going to want to hear this one out. State lawmakers have a plan to find more money for K-12, higher education, and even roads. But it will require your permission to give up your Tabor refund for life. We don't think that this is going to be a solution to long-term needs in transportation and higher ed or K-12 but we think it's a really good first step. The Taxpayer Bill of Rights limits how much money the state can keep each year. And if the state collects too much, the extra money is supposed to be refunded. First, as a property tax credit for seniors and disabled vets. If there's still some left, there could be a sales tax refund or a one-year reduction of the state income tax. So how much are we talking about? House Speaker Casey Becker gave a wide three-year estimate between 65 million and 1 billion. I know that's a very big range. Somewhere within that range, we, it's, it's hard to know if are we going to have a recession in the next couple of years. One of my first votes as an 18 or 19 year old was I voted for Tabor in 1992. Republican Senator Kevin Priola is in support of the Tabor timeout, something former Republican Governor Bill Owens agreed with in 2005 when he campaigned in favor of Referendum C, a five year Tabor timeout for schools, health care, law enforcement, retirement and a little for roads. Roads. That passed with 52% of the vote. As the speaker said, this isn't a magic bullet. This isn't going to solve everything, but it's a step in the right direction. In the last 25 years, Tabor refunds have been issued eight times, including this year. 16 million going back through that senior property tax credit.
In an emailed statement, Rep Representative Patrick Neville, the top Republican in the House, he wrote, Democrats can't pay for all their empty promises made in the last election, so now they want to permanently eliminate your tax refunds to pay for their expensive programs. It is egregious that the Democrats want to forever take away your consent on what is done with your tax dollars. But that's the beauty of Tabor. Voters have the final say on topics like this. All but four of the state's 178 school districts have been asked for and received voter approval to keep extra tax money. And cities have asked their voters questions like this, Kyle, 572 times, and the Tabor override passed 86% of the time. Okay. Math. <laughs> math. Math is what it is. I apologize. I was yelling at you during your story, <laughs> asking you questions, and that's not fair. You were trying to focus. Thank you, Marshall. So Democrats in the state legislature, they've been trying to, to call Republicans bluff. I apologize. I've screwed this up again. You have something else for us. So you saw that Senator Kevin Priola was in that yeah. piece. And we've wondered, like, is he the outlier Republican in a Democratic-controlled legislature? Yep. And is he putting himself at risk in 2020? Here's what he had to say about putting his neck out there. I don't think following Tabor and what Tabor prescribes is political su suicide. If folks want to fault me for following Tabor and trying to actually solve problems and keep people out of traffic, so be it. He has talked about traffic problems where he lives in Adams County. Yeah. I looked up his election in 2016. Mm -hmm. He's up for re-election in 2020 if he wants. He won by 2,700 votes. So if, uh, it's a questionable district, and he's doing probably what it takes to appease the voters in his district, but also it's a tough district to win two years from now. Yeah. Hey, wasn't that, wasn't he the dude that, uh, that minority leader uh, Neville sat here and threatened him with a recall over, what was it, supervised heroin injection sites? Same guy. Same guy. Same guy. Oh man, his primary could be interesting. All right, very good. Thank you, Marshall, for real. Thank you this time. Sorry. After Democrats in the state legislature lost a court battle yesterday on whether they can speed read that super long bill, they're now saying, well, they just won't bring up that bill again. They're going to call Republicans bluff to keep them from using that reading as a days long stalling technique. I'm not going to bring that bill back up unless uh, there's a commitment that it's not going to be turned into a political football again. Um, but it's a Republican bill, not a Democratic bill. So it's not. Uh, a huge um, loss for me if that bill doesn't come back up for debate. When there's a bill on the table that is long, but ha is a real policy debate that we need to have as a legislature, we will have that debate. Uh, nothing will be laid over simply because it is slightly long. Yes, that's, that's the thing. The bill that was at the center, this whole big fight and the lawsuit and everything else, it wasn't one of the controversial ones. They just picked it because it was really long. So there is a bill that comes up in every session. It's called the long bill, which despite its name is actually a lot shorter than the one that Republicans were using to stall. That one is going to have to be read aloud. So there's going to be a slowdown, but not one that's going to take days. Hey, Denver's mayoral ballot is finalized for May's election. The candidates appear in randomly drawn order. Here's what it's going to look like. Former state Senator Penfield Tate sits atop the ballot. Then incumbent Mayor Michael Hancock is next, followed by community activist Kaylin Rose Heffernan. Then after that, Jamie Gillis, who ran the Rhino Art District, followed by Chairman Siku, Stephen Evans, he's a constant commenter at city council meetings, and finally, social justice advocate Lisa Calderon. If no candidate wins 50% plus one, the top two advance to a runoff in June. 50 years ago today, Chicano students walked out of West High School in Denver to demand respect, respect for their language, respect for their culture. Sony Gutierrez has a look back. On March 20th, 1969, approximately 150 to 200 students staged a walk off. The steps of West High School painted a different picture. In protest of alleged racist remarks made by a teacher at that school. Chicanos were tired of being treated unfairly. Students, you know, who were chastised for bringing food from home and, you know, needing to eat in the corner silently and, you know, having their hands slapped for speaking Spanish. Even when you know, students uh, tried their best, Teresa and Mia, principal and resident principal now, say they've heard stories of how students still got disrespectful comments from their teachers. That Mexicans are stupid and if you're stupid, if your family speaks Spanish. So Chicanos united and did something about it. They created a list of demands. This is one of the first drafts. They were asking for Spanish teachers for access to different opportunities aside from being recruited for the war. Number three, a principal with a Spanish surname must be appointed to administer West High School. And the first answer is no. no. That's not going to happen yeah, in 1969. No. But in 2019, 50 years later, there are now 
three Chicana leaders um, here in, the principal, in principal uh, roles, plus we have other Chicano administrators as well. Daughters of two men who were a part of the West High School blowouts. Her father's out front mm -hmm. as part of the protest and as part of the crusade for justice and actually getting arrested as part of that. And then my father is inside and supporting students and helping. Are now helping run the school together. And here we are. Mm -hmm. co-leading 50 years later. They're an example for students now. I don't think I would have gotten the same opportunities at any other high school as I get them here. Who want to continue the legacy of a community that fought for their opportunities. What we're asked to do is to preserve culture, yeah. to preserve language, to right. fight for justice and to, pre to fight for access. And that's really our call today. It's no different. For next, Thank you, class of 2019. I'm Sonia Gutierrez. Both Teresa and Mia told us they feel like we've come a long way. Next, they're focused on more opportunities for students who were brought to this country illegally. I would not have guessed this connection existed. And we saw that there's a bridge, a natural bridge between the art scene, the street art scene here in Denver and the one in Paris. A connection they want local artists to build on. And becoming one of the best student jazz bands in America doesn't happen easily. I would say the most amazing thing about it is that you're surrounded by all these other kids that are challenging you. We'll listen to a band from Denver that's up to the challenge next. It's a sign that if you cannot see the sidewalk in Colorado, you probably should not use said sidewalk. Somebody in Crested Butte just wanted to be extra safe, so they printed out a nice little sign warning that there is a sidewalk somewhere under all of that snow, but it is closed because all that snow is coming off of roofs nearby. Next viewer, Kathy Kinbard spotted this, emailed it to next at 9news.com. Kathy does not have Twitter, and that's a good call because Twitter's a cesspool. But if you do tweet, you can share your signs there with the hashtag HeyNext. Hey there, we are looking just beautiful for our first day of the spring season. Finally felt like it too. Take a look at some of our extremes for our spring equinox. The warmest one we've had 77. That was in 2017 and the snowiest since about 2001 was actually back in 2006. 1.8 inches of snowfall coming through. None of that today here in the Mile High City. We hit 57 60s across northern Colorado, across the eastern plains and then 30s and 40s going up in the mountains. But this evening the views 
stunning. Tough to find really any clouds out there. High pressure has been building in, keeping us nice and dry today. One storm system pushing out across the Midwest and another one moving into California. That one will eventually make its way to the mountains by tomorrow morning. Tonight, mostly clear skies. Be sure to check out that super moon. Temperatures falling into the 20s for the metro with teens and low 20s up in the mountains. So rest of tonight looking good. Tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. That's when you'll start to see the first signs of this storm system pushing across the San Juans by about 4 or 5 o'clock. It makes its way along I 70 and we might see an icy little rain shower won't last long. It won't accumulate too much and then it quickly moves out. Snowfall is still going strong through early Friday morning and we do have some advisories going in the San Juans for about 8 to 16 inches of snowfall coming through 58 on tap tomorrow. We'll stay in the 60s across the plains, 30s and 40s going up in the mountains. We'll cool things off Friday, bring back a chance for a couple of thunderstorms around here. A dry day on Saturday with more rain and snow possible Sunday afternoon, evening into Monday morning. We clear that storm system out and then Kyle 65 70 next week. Mm, looks like a dream. The color of the sun balls. Right here. Well done D money right here. Thank First you. Day of spring. <laughs> so here here's something interesting. Denver has a thing for France and the feeling apparently is mutual. The Alliance Francaise has been spreading French culture in Denver for more than a century now and this week they brought an artist straight from Paris to create a mural on their building in the Santa Fe Art District. It's not just a regular graffiti that you can find, you know, in a corner of the street. The first idea really was to, to create some kind of landmark for our cultural center to be like, you know, more visible in the neighborhood. We saw that there's a bridge, a natural bridge between the art scene, the street art scene here in Denver and the one in Paris. That's why we invited that guy here. Vodou represent. So that guy is called Dacruz. I love having like some something local and I discovered the donuts that are very good. <laughs> Dacruz is a very specific uh, artistic touch. You know, those big eyes, those masks, that's really his mark. That's a mix of different cultures. That, that's something I, I love to do is, for me, that's the good globalization. That's a mix of the cultures. For this particular piece, we wanted to echo, you know, the French flag with the American flag, the white, blue and red. American and Francais, c'est couleur tricolore. Blue, blanc, rouge. Small touches about, you know, Colorado, whatever we can put, you know, to, to make, I mean, try to uh, materialize this bridge between the French culture, the local culture, you know, and what we, we want to embrace, you know, cultural exchange and, and, uh, and understanding, basically. All around the world, you have like big, big events on street art. So for a big city like Denver, it's obvious that you have to be here. Fait ta publicité, c'est bon. <laughs> Merci. To be able to create bridges, links, ties between, you know, Denver and France, you know, in any kind of ways is really what drives us. <laughs> Killer accent too. If you're near Confluence Park on Friday, you might catch the crews out there working on another mural right alongside an artist from Colorado. <laughs> Young musicians from Denver are so good, they want to give them a listen to New York. And I did uh, text uh, one of the kids and says, say, get this message out to all the kids that, that the band is going to New York. And tonight we are mining for your Google Earth gold, the weird things caught in a passing moment. You've got some good ones next.
99% work, 1% performance. That's how Dave Hammond describes the success of his top jazz band this year. He directs the bands over at Denver School of the Arts. And that jazz band has been invited to go to New York City to compete against the best in the country. Yeah. Here we go. One, two, one. We are rehearsing for the essentially Ellington High School Jazz Band Competition and Festival, which happens in New York. First week of May, only 15 bands from across the country were selected to uh, compete. I'm Dave Hammond, Denver School of the Arts. I'm the band director here. As long as I've got the drummer on my side, man. I'm good to go. I love this festival because it's really, really, really serious for kids and it really will change their lives. It's with Wynton Marsalis and the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. They're all tremendous players. They're some of the best jazz players walking around on the planet. Uh, we went in 2017 and we were uh, placed second out of 15, which was awesome. This band is real serious about uh, placing in the top three as well. I think. We will, with some more work, for sure. My name is Alex Street, and I'm a senior here at Denver School of the Arts, and I play the vibraphone. All the kids are very serious, no messing around. They're willing to spend hours and hours working at something um, that they know is gonna be a little bit better. I uh, wish them the best in New York. All right, so you know how my new obsession is the weird scenes that are captured on Google Street View? You know, you turn around, you look, you see weird stuff. So I've asked you for the best stuff that you found hidden along Colorado's side streets and roads, and you sent us some gems. Next.
Let's explore the weird, wonderful scenes in our state you spotted on Google Street View. Views, including you. Like Jason in Denver, who told us he tried to hide his face when the Google car came by his bike on 29th near Clinton. Jacob and his mom are immortalized online, making the opposite choice at their place in Aurora. Teresa spotted a dog chasing the Google vehicle down a road in southern Colorado. And Pat from Inglewood says his uncle was up working in the Dakotas when Google caught his best side while he was out picking weeds. Andy was in town for a conference, saw me in black and navy, wanted a better jacket tonight, Andy. Are you not entertained? See you next time.